Uh, welcome to Progressive Shortcakes. This is Joe Firestone, your host. And the topic of this uh, short take is getting Trump out. Of course, there are many people thinking about this and discussing possible difficulties in getting uh, Trump out because of all the hints he's dropped and all the uh, uh, funny remarks that he's made, which he alternately says he's joking about, and, and he seems dead serious about them all. But it seems pretty clear that he doesn't want to leave, that he's afraid if he does leave, he's going to be prosecuted in the state of New York and perhaps in other places okay, as well, and that there's nothing he'd like better than to be the president for life. Okay, in the United States. I previously went over a very good piece by Francis Fox uh, 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 Piven and Deepak uh, uh, Bargava that talked about the kind of mass action we would need to get uh, Trump out of there uh, there now is a piece which appeared in Defense One and was written by John, um, I guess, okay, it's Nagel and Paul Gingling, um, uh, who are retired military people, who wrote an article for Defense One, which is which is a defense publication. And the headline in the article is, quote, all enemies, foreign and um, um, domestic, unquote, an open letter to General Milley. And the letter says, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, you're well aware of your duties in ordinary times to serve as the principal military advisor to the President of the United States and to transmit the lawful orders of the President and Secretary of Defense to combatant uh, commanders. Ordinary times, these duties are entirely consistent with your oath to, quote, support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and uh, domestic, unquote. And then they say, we do not live in ordinary times. The President of the United States is actively subverting our electoral system threatening to remain in office in defiance of our Constitution. In a few months' time, you may have to choose between defying a lawless president or betraying your constitutional oath. We write to assist you in thinking clearly about that choice. If Donald Trump refuses to leave office at the expiration of his constitutional term, the United States military must remove him by force, and you must give that order due to a dangerous confluence of circumstances, the once unthinkable scenario of authoritarian rule in the United States is now a very real possibility. First, as Mr. Trump faces near electoral defeat, he is vigorously undermining public confidence in our elections. Second, Mr. Trump's defeat would result in his facing not merely political um, uh, um, ignominy, but also criminal charges. Third, Mr. Trump is assembling a private army capable of thwarting not only the will of the electorate, but also the capacities of ordinary law enforcement. When these forces collide on January 20th, 2021, the U.S. military will be the only institution capable of upholding our constitutional uh, uh, um, order. Now notice, they don't say they're the only institution capable of keeping order. They're not looking at it as solving the problem of keeping order in the United States by force. They're looking at it as the U.S. military being the only institution capable of defending our Constitution. There can be little doubt that Mr. Trump is facing electoral defeat. More than 160,000 Americans have died from COVID-19, 
I'm sorry, I forgot to give you the date of this. It was on August 11th. So at that time, there were something like 160,000 Americans that had died from COVID-19. As you know by now, it's 181,000 now. And he said that total is likely to rise to 300,000 by November. I would say more likely by the beginning of December, but uh, I don't know. We might get a spike in the fall as it gets uh, cooler. Anyway, they say one in 10 U.S. workers is unemployed, and the U.S. economy in the last quarter suffered the greatest contraction in its history. Nearly 70% of Americans believe the country's on the wrong track. Yes, that figure is still at 68% at present. The Economist estimates that Mr. Trump's chances of losing the election stand at 91%. I know, I know, Hillary's chances were considered very high in 2016 also, and she lost, but when people keep coming up with that example, they are not saying, they are not considering that that was before four years of Trump was experienced by the American public. People didn't have experience with Trump. Some people wanted to take flyers with Trump to shake up the system because they were unaware of how terrible Trump's presidency can be. Now, with 181,000 people dead and counting, they have a much clearer picture of what the dangers of having Trump as the president are. I think it's quite unlikely that he can come back from having a 91% chance of losing the election or come back from the 9 or 10 point lead Joe Biden has uh, right now. We shall see, of course, because Biden is doing everything he can to sabotage things with stupidity. We'll go into that stupidity at some other time. But faced with these grim prospects, Mr. Trump has engaged in a systemic disinformation campaign to undermine public confidence in our elections. His falsely claim that mail-in voting is, quote, inaccurate and fraudulent. He is actively sabotaging the U.S. Postal Service in an effort to delay and discredit a mail-in votes. He has suggested um, delaying the 2020 election despite lacking the authority to do so. The stakes of the 2020 election are especially high for Mr. Trump. In defeat, he will likely face criminal prosecution. The Manhattan District Attorney is investigating the Trump Organization for possible bank and insurance fraud related to the overvaluation of financial assets. New York's Attorney General is conducting similar investigations, having successfully subpoenaed Trump's financial records from Deutsche Bank. Mr. Trump um, um, has allegedly pressured the U.S. Ambassador to Great Britain to pressure the British government to move the British Open Golf Tournament to Trump Turnberry Resort in Scotland. This incident is but one of many examples of self-dealing that may lead to federal criminal charges against the president. And that certainly should already have been sufficient grounds for his impeachment and removal from office. Given this dizzying array of threats, not merely to his political prospects, but also his liberty and wealth, Mr. Trump is following the playbook of dictators throughout history. He's building a private army, answerable only to him. When Caesar faced the prospect of a trial in Rome, he did not return to face his day in court. He unleashed an army personally loyal to him alone on the Roman government. No student of history, Mr. Trump nevertheless appears to be following Caesar's example. The president's use of militarized homeland security agents uh, against domestic political demonstrations constitutes the creation of a paramilitary force unaccountable to the public. The members of this private army, often lacking police insignia or other identification, exist not to enforce the law, but to intimidate the president's political opponents. These powerful cross currents, um, but Mr. Trump's electoral defeat, his assault on the integrity of our elections, his impending criminal prosecution and his creation of a private army will collide on January 20th. Rather than accept the peaceful transfer of power that has been the hallmark of American democracy since its inception, Mr. Trump may refuse to leave office. Excuse me for a second. 
he would likely offer as a fig leaf of legitimacy the shop worn lies about election fraud. Mr. Trump's um, accolades in right wing media, um, acolytes in right wing media, will certainly rush to repeat and amplify these lies. Manufacturing sufficient uh, evidence to provide a pretext of plausibility. Um, America's greatest constitutional crisis since the Civil War will come about by a president who simply refuses to leave office. Um, our political institutions have so atrophied they're ill-prepared for this moment. Senate uh, Republicans already reduced to supplicant status will remain silent and um, inert as much to obscure their complicity as to retain their majority. And the Democrat-led House of Representatives will certify the Electoral College results. Will Trump will dismiss his fake news? The courts flooded with cases from both Democrats and Mr. Trump's legal team will take months working through the docket, producing reasoned rulings that Trump will alternately appeal and ignore. Then the clock will strike 12.01 p.m. January 20th, 2021, and Donald Trump will be sitting in the Oval Office. The street protests will inevitably swell outside the White House, and the ranks of Trump's private army will grow inside its grounds. The Speaker of the House will declare the Trump um, the presidency at an end and direct the Secret Service and federal marshals to remove Trump from the premises. These agents will realize they're outmanned and outgunned by Trump's private army, and the moment of decision will arrive. So notice that. The Speaker of the House will declare the Trump presidency at an end and direct the Sacred Service and federal marshals to remove him from the premises. These agents will realize they are outmanned and outgunned by his private army from the Department of Homeland Security and from other groups that are supportive of Trump. And then the moment of decision is going to come because of the presence of the private army keeping him in the White House. At this moment of constitutional crisis, only two options remain. Under the first, military forces of the United States escort the former president from the White House grounds. Trump's little green men so intimidate, so intimidating to lightly arm federal law enforcement agents step aside and fade away, realizing they would not constitute a good morning's work for a brigade of the 82nd uh, Airborne Division. Under the second, the U.S. military remains inert while the Constitution dies. The succession of government is determined by extra-legal violence between Trump's private army and street protesters. Uh, Black Lives Matter Plaza becomes um, Tahrir Square. That, of course, is a reference to what happened okay, in Egypt during the Arab Spring. As the senior military officer of the United States, the choice between these two options lies with you. In the constitutional crisis described above, your duty is to give unambiguous orders directing U.S. military forces to support the constitutional transfer of power. Should you remain silent, you will be complicit in a coup d'etat. You were rightly criticized for your prior active complicity in the president's use of force against peaceful uh, protesters in Lafayette Square. Your passive complicity in an extra-legal seizure of political power would be far worse for 240 years, the United States has been spared the horror of violent political succession, imperfect though it may be. Our union has been moving toward greater perfection from one peaceful transfer of power to the next. I think our friends here neglect the little incident of the Civil War, incidentally, when we were not spared the horror of uh, violent uh, succession. The rule of law created by our Constitution has made this miracle possible. However, our constitutional order is not self-sustaining. Throughout our history, Americans have laid down their lives so that this form of government may endure, continuing the unfinished work for which these heroes fell 
now falls to you, lest you forget, I, Mark A. Milley, this is quotes, I, Mark A. Milley, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I will take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office in which I am about to enter. So help me God, unquote. The fate of our republic may well depend on your adherence to this oath. Respectfully yours, John Nago and Paul Yingling. John Nagel is a retired officer and veteran of both Iraq wars and is head of school at the Haverford School outside uh, Philadelphia. And Paul Yingling is a retired uh, U.S. Army lieutenant colonel, served three tours in Iraq, served another tour uh, in Bosnia, and a fifth in Operation Desert Storm. So, I thought that was extremely interesting, extremely interesting, but that okay, is not alone. There's another piece that appeared in Common Dreams by Jeffrey C. Isaac, and I won't go through this on a word-for-word -word basis, but uh, um, but Jeffrey Isaac is worried about the same thing, of course. And after going over what Trump uh, has been like in his attitudes and his similarity to other um, um, authoritarians, he says, it is thus also likely that citizens who care about democracy will be called upon to defend it. And he calls attention to two commentaries in recent days. The first is the Piven and uh, uh, Bargava uh, commentary that I called attention to before. And he quotes the subtitle from that. We must lay the groundwork now for the kind of mass action that defends democracy and evicts this despicable, racist, wannabe authoritarian from the White House, unquote. And then he also calls attention to uh, the piece by Nagel, okay, and uh, by Yingling, outlining the dangers that Trump poses, okay, to democracy. And uh, they then call on Milley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, to defend the Constitution in the event that Trump refuses to leave office as required by law and instead seeks to encourage his supporters to defend him even by force of arms. And he quotes... Uh, from what I just quoted from uh, the Nago, okay, and Yingling piece, and points out that it is striking and indeed horrifying that such an open letter would need to be published now, just as it is striking that uh, retired uh, General uh, 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 James. Um, um, General Mattis, and retired Admiral Mike Mullen, only recently published similar warnings. Jeffrey Isaac says, we're at a moment of great peril, and whether the coercive power of the state will be deployed in constitutionally democratic ways is genuinely in question. And he says that Nag, okay, and the Yingling's letter is the perfect complement to Piven, okay, and to Bargava's powerful call from the left for preparations of mass street uh, but protest. Uh, and he points out that uh, uh, the uh, uh, the piece by Piven Bargava present their strategy as a rebuke to establishment uh, on forces, unquote, 
the professional communicators, technocrats, and lawyers in much of the mainstream um, Democratic Party and some in the media will be horrified by this call for a mass nonviolent uprising in response to the theft of an election. Uh, and Isaac says, I think the extraordinary BLM protests of this summer have normalized protests for many. I also think they exaggerate the radicalism of their proposal, which is essentially a strategy of demonstrating through nonviolent protests that Trump must be evicted, quote unquote. Their very nuanced piece does not call for the seizing of the White House. It envisions the use of protest and direct citizen action as a way of enforcing the law. This means convincing the state and its police and military forces to uphold the law and not to use violence against citizens in defense of a dictator. No serious person imagines. I think that's an excellent point by Jeffrey Isaacs. And he says, no serious person imagines we're on the cusp of a genuine revolutionary situation, quote unquote, which would be an utter disaster Um, along every imaginable dimension, including the fact that the masses who are armed and organized are right-wing militias, not likely to support uh, uh, the radical democracy. The point of taking to the streets if this becomes unnecessary is to work in tandem, a complex agonistic collaboration to be sure uh, with professional politicians, communicators, lawyers, uh, with bureaucrats and police and military officers to defend the rule of law. Trump must go. And then the real universe of democratic politics can continue. Jeffrey C. Isaac is the James H. H. Rudy Professor of um, uh, Political Science at um, um, Indiana University okay, in Bloomington. His books include uh, Democracy in Dark Times, 1998, and The Poverty of uh, 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 Progressivism, The Future of American Democracy in a Time of Liberal Decline, and also Arendt, um, uh, 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 Camus, and modern rebellion. Sounds like a person I have a lot in common with. Anyway, I think those two articles, okay, in juxtaposition, uh, really express what I feel. I endorse them both uh, rather strongly. I think we need to have the mass movement called for by Piven and Bargava. And we need also to have the action of uh, General Milley and the military forces in upholding the Constitution if Trump is not willing to lead. We need both. And we also need uh, the collaboration of the other forces called out by Jeff Isaac in his post. So that's this progressive short take. Again, it's not as short as I would have liked it, but I do like it. And so I will um, end this here, but I'll remind you that I'm at patreon.com front slash Joe Firestone. And I'll see you soon with another progressive short take. Thank you.